Thank you so much, Akhil. And uh, I, I feel very privileged to be among the group of uh, speakers that you have. <laughs> I've had a look through them. Quite an intimidating bunch of people. Um, although they're all very pleasant when you meet them. And I know many of them uh, personally, and as, as, as you do too, through the summer school and other, other uh, events. So uh, this is a really wonderful opportunity. Um, a little bit scary because it's not what I usually um, do or what we usually talk about, but uh, nonetheless, let, let's have a go and see what I can do. I'm going to try and share my screen here. So hopefully everybody is seeing that. Um, if Akil yes. nods his head, then I'm I'm happy. Um, that's good. Uh, so we're going to talk about, I suppose, the future of biophotonics. And I left that up there as a very broad title because I'm very conscious of the fact that the main areas that we currently work in, uh, including photoacoustics, which has been very nicely covered by Sarah Bondiak at Cambridge, and uh, OCT, which has been exquisitely covered, uh, of course, by David Sampson. And I encourage anybody who hasn't looked at those uh, to look at them. And, and in fact, David and, and probably uh, Sarah have also touched on the other imaging uh, techniques that, that come around that. So I'm gonna say a little bit about what we do in that area maybe, but um, I am going to try to do a little bit of what I was asked as well to talk about, you know, what is the future? And that's a very difficult thing to do. Of course, if we knew that, uh, we could be millionaires or we would be already there. Um, and then it's not the future anymore. So uh, let's, let's see how we go. Um, my group um, has been involved in, uh, uh, my main interest, I suppose, was different to other people in the sense that my, it, it was, driven by the application. So we wanted to see the microcirculation and I worked under the professor of dermatology in Oxford at the time, Terence Ryan, and he had uh, been among the first to publish in the modern era around imaging the, the microcirculation. I say modern era because Malpighi famously proved that um, blood goes from the um, arteries to the to the veins via the, the lungs in little capillaries by being able to see uh, that happen in the frog's lung with the help of um, the type of microscope that was developed by uh, Van Leeuwenhoek, um, not the type uh, which was developed by uh, Robert Hooke and Swammerdam and others, which was a compound microscope and, and didn't really allow for that. So. Um, one might have put one's bet on the very fancy compound uh, microscope technology, but uh, indeed there is probably a lesson there to show that a simple ball lens, um, a simpler technology uh, could be the most effective and was the most effective for many, many years. So it, it essentially got a, a factor of 10 improvement in resolution over the compound microscope, but... Um, uh, but more importantly, it was able to see uh, important things clinically that, that you couldn't see. And, and that's something to, to keep in mind throughout this talk and other talks. You know, seeing prettier pictures is one thing, but actually seeing something that changes a, a diagnosis or your ideas around a discovery or a therapy um, is what we're really looking for. So um, does it get you over that hump, I suppose, is the question. So we, we, anyway, to go back to the story, we, we, we uh, developed laser Doppler perfusion imaging and um, started a company called Oxford Optronics, uh, which is still going. Um, then um, other people are involved in that area. Laser spectral contrast imaging became, uh, I suppose, faster, uh, although there are some, still some questions about uh, the validity and where it's valid and the depth in particular. Uh, then I started to collaborate with uh, a previous competitor who I met at trade shows regularly, uh, Yert Nielsen, to develop diffuse reflectance imaging. And one of my earliest, in fact, my earliest PhD student, uh, Jim O'Doherty, uh, published the early work around uh, tissue viability imaging based on the diffuse reflectance principle. Um, then we got into optical coherence tomography when it became possible to see deep enough uh, where you could actually get to the 
microvessels within the tissue without all that scattered diffuse light. So you could see them clearly and you can see in the bottom right of the image here is a, a nice picture that Joey Enfield, uh, another one of my PhD students, produced based on a method that we developed called correlation mapping, um, optical coherence tomography, uh, and that's become useful for um, microangiography and in fact in OCT that was the big thing about three years ago I think 2017 uh, in OCT especially in the eye all the companies moved to have angiographic techniques many of them based on uh, decorrelation of the components of the the image where the elements of the image where uh, there was movement and and hence uh, that showed an image then of uh, blood where the blood was flowing. Um, in order to see deeper uh, we have to use diffuse light um, because we don't have any ballistic photons when they go straight in and come straight back anymore after about a millimeter in the tissue. People talk about two but probably more realistic to talk about one millimeter in, in skin, brain uh, and, and most human tissues other than the eye. Um, and even in the eye, then when you get to the retina, you're back that to one millimeter from the surface again. Getting deeper with diffuse optics uh, means using something like diffuse optical tomography or in our case, photoacoustic imaging. And I'll, I'll say just a few words around that. And um, the, the picture of the mobile phone here indicates that uh, we, we did some early work in developing apps um, in the very early days, as you can see with the, with the BlackBerry phone, uh, to show where the blood is in the microcirculation. That's an image from the surface of my forearm after metal nicotinamide was placed first eight minutes before and then 11 minutes uh, earlier. And the image that's just flown in is to remind us that we, we, we uh, did the, the first um, heart rate app algorithm uh, and there are many, many people using that now. So um, to say a few words about things we've done in OCT quickly, and I'm just gonna skip over all of this, but happy to answer questions or send people papers if they want to email me. Um, and uh, I think you can easily find my email address. So we, we've worked on label-free imaging domains because of course that means that we don't interfere with the biology. And it turns out that we can uh, do things like uh, sense the cha any changes that are going on at the nano level. And also um, we developed a super resolution image technique uh, based on the variation in intensity in depth. So it turns out that this variation in depth can go through your objective without any problem, um, whereas we cannot see maybe the changes at the surface uh, very close to each other, closer than the resolution, the lateral resolution limit of the system. So if you have information in depth, you can get a much higher resolution uh, from the same objective lens, which is uh, quite neat because you don't need any extra uh, hardware or, uh, you know, suit the other super resolution techniques or fluorescence or anything else to do that. Um, and so it, it's based on that simple idea that we have different intensities and so we can uh, separate spots that are very close to each other. And um, if we have an idea of what we're looking for, the size and the spectrum of the thing that we're looking for, we can actually uh, impose that onto the image and get um, matching locations within the image and that further improves our image quality. Sarah Bontic, as I mentioned, did a very nice talk last week, I believe, on uh, photoacoustics, uh, although she may have called it optoacoustics, and there is a, a debate in uh, the, the uh, field about which is the appropriate term. Um, my bet is, is whichever one gets into the Oxford English Dictionary is, is the right one, uh, but you could also do a search in the scientific literature um, and, and see which one gets the most hits, right? Uh, probably photoacoustics, and certainly in Google you will get uh, photoacoustics coming up as the most um, 
used one. Uh, so it turns out like many other techniques, if we want to get higher resolution, we have to go to a higher frequency or shorter wavelength. And uh, that uh, leads then to a reduction in the depth we can see within tissue with all of these techniques here. We're looking at the blood vessels and you might notice that we're actually seeing the top and the bottom of the blood vessels uh, mostly. Photoacoustics works by putting a very short pulse of light into the tissue and it gives a real shake to the tissue and you get all the frequencies coming back. Uh, so you can use any transducer you want, but if you want to get high resolution, you'll use a high frequency transducer to measure what's coming back. The pulse has to be short enough so that there is no dilation of, um, uh, dilution of, the, of the signal with, uh, with the heat dissipating out of the volume uh, and so on. So we, we talk about less than 10 nanosecond pulses, ideally for to maximize the energy that's been captured in the photoacoustic signal. And we can look at the resolutions that we can get, not as impressive as microscopy or OCT, uh, but we're seeing much deeper inside the tissue. Um, if we want to see deeper, um, there's been an awful lot of work in optical clearing of um, animals and, and uh, ex vivo tissues. I do want to highlight that it is possible to do similar things in living animals and humans. And uh, one of the easiest ways of doing this is using uh, a fructose-based gel that you can put on the surface of the tissue. And uh, you may notice that uh, you can see many more vessels here, or you can see vessels which you couldn't see before. Um, inside the tissue in a, in a living human in a very um, safe way. Uh, we've also been working on the use of plasmonic gold nanostars in order to track cells as they go into the tissue um, and uh, to see where they go and what they do in um, first in animals, uh, then in large animals, uh, then in uh, eventually we hope in humans because many of the wonderful things that are happening with stem cell um, therapies is being held up by the regulators on the basis that they don't know where they go and what they do um, in the areas other than uh, the site of interest. Of course, you also have to produce uh, evidence of efficacy in site of interest. Gold nanostars are interesting because uh, gold nanoparticles typically give you um, a tenfold increase in signal by comparison with a dye and uh, longer um, particles give you higher sensitivity at the longer wavelengths, especially if the aspect ratio um, is large. So to get to beyond a thousand nanometers, which is where we want to be, to get deep inside the tissue, to be able to use all the extra energy that we can do in the safety standard. Remember the safety standard allows much more energy at 1064 than it does at 730, uh, which is a competitor wavelength for depth in the tissue. And I suppose the things that count there are whether you have lots of blood or um, in which case 730 might not be a good idea um, or, or much less blood, in which case uh, 730 might work fine and you have the advantage you can use silicon as a detector or camera. Uh, 10, 1064 gives you the advantage that there is a very well-established stable laser uh, there that will give you reproducible uh, pulses and it is in the minimum of the absorption band and uh, coinciding with very low scattering. And remember that scattering is the dominant loss mechanism in uh, tissue between the blood uh, absorption at 600 nanometers and below and the water absorption at uh, 1400 nanometers and above. So we want as much energy as possible to be deposited at this wavelength and we've worked on that over the years, uh, partly in this uh, StarStem uh, project. If you look at starstem.eu, you will see what we're doing there. We're uh, 
uh, tagging the uh, stem cells, uh, we're putting them into uh, tissue cultures, then small animals, uh, then into the knee of a large animal, in this case, a sheep. And the knee is here, by the way, not here. That's the wrist uh, by comparison with humans. And so we uh, want to be able to see where those cells go, in what concentration, uh, in the site of interest, but also the biodistribution. And so we've worked over the years to move as much of the energy as possible into um, absorption at this long wavelength. And that means having long spikes in our stars. The stars don't tend to congregate so much as well. And uh, uh, they, they don't lose or shift their wavelength as much in vivo as nano rods would uh, because they naturally uh, separate enough I think. So um, one big challenge we have now and in the future in terms of imaging is our, our friends who are doing regenerative medicine and looking at any kind of medical issues really want to be able to see what's going on at great depths. But they are, they're used to, um, and they can do that with, with standard ultrasound, MRI and X-ray CT, but they're used to having these wonderful images that they get with confocal microscopy and especially fluorescence microscopy, uh, which is subcellular resolution. So they'd like to have sampling depths of tens of millimeters and resolutions of less than a micron, but there is no technique that allows us to do that. Um, and it is amazing that if we look across all the various techniques, we find a limit of uh, depth to axial resolution ratio of uh, less than 200. In other words, you can see as deep as you want, but the resolution you get will be that depth divided by 200 at best, no matter what technique you use. And these are very, very different techniques. Uh, Precessing protons, high energy x-rays, uh, sound, um, and, and, you know, microscopy and so on. And why is this, you might ask yourself. Well, um, the short answer is the deeper we go, the bigger the voxel we have to integrate our signal over. So um, these nanostructural stuff we see, we see different um, uh, nanostructures. Uh, this is stuff that we can't see with an o a common OCT system. We have to look at the raw signal and extract uh, the uh, high spatial frequency information. And uh, then we uh, show this on top of the OCT uh, image and we show where the changes in uh, the nanostructural uh, sizes is happening. And uh, in that case, because the iris is not exposed, we don't see very much change over time Whereas the cornea, even over a very short uh, period of time, we see a change in the uh, structure uh, sizes within the cornea due to dehydration. The cornea is at the outside of the, of the eye. It's the surface lens. Um, going back to photoacoustics, we, we have worked a bit on fluence correction and uh, the, this is, I suppose, the common problem for imaging. You need to know how much of the um, actuating signal, if you like, is getting uh, to various parts of the tissue. And if that's uh, decreasing over depth, you need to account for that if you want to do any quantitative uh, imaging. And quantitative imaging is really uh, important for getting reproducible results. Uh, so we are working to overcome these, um, these problems. And uh, to cut a long story short, we uh, use the fluence that we get from an artery, which is close uh, or somewhere within the volume of interest, and use that in order to correct the fluence for the entire volume. So if we, we know what the fluence is at the artery because we know very well what the absorption coefficient of an artery is. An artery will always have 
uh, an arterial oxygen saturation of 97% plus or minus 3%. Uh, and that is because it doesn't really lose oxygen until you get to the very, very small vessels. Um, and so we do this correction there. And so the idea is if we know what the fluence is here, we can work out uh, what the fluence is over here and actually in this whole volume around it. But knowing that we can then work out what is the oxygen saturation or the concentration of some other analyte in this volume of tissue over here. So I think that's an exciting way forward. Um, other people are, are trying other means to get to that point. Just quickly to say that uh, melanoma and staging uh, of cancers in general is a very important topic. Uh, a melanoma that is uh, within the epidermis uh, just needs to be cut out with a scalpel and you put a band-aid on it and go home. If it has invaded into the deeper tissue, it is able to move around and therefore you, um, you could have metastases. And if you have metastases, uh, you have roughly 5% chance of still being alive in five years. So it's a very big difference between go home with a Band-Aid and 5% um, chance of survival. Um, so it's very important to as early as possible see where is the depth of this. And currently uh, one will look at these lesions and if they are sufficiently suspicious, the um, surgeon, plastic surgeon or um, our dermatologist will uh, send a biopsy off to the lab and a couple of weeks later we find out uh, whether the depth of it and whether it's malignant. Uh, with photoacoustics, because melanin has a very high absorption, we can uh, see where that melanin is in the melanoma and uh, see if it has invaded or not. Uh, this becomes a big issue on complicated lesions like this, not so much on this one because you can biopsy the whole thing and find the depth of it, but which part of this would you biopsy? The pathology lab is not going to get the depth of all of this huge um, lesion, so uh, you need to decide uh, which part of it you're going to biopsy and hope that the part you biopsy uh, has the malignant tissue if, it, if there is any. Uh, and has the deepest um, depth so you can tell if it's invaded or not. Um, so that's a bit complicated. Uh, we've done, or Adon uh, Branock in my group has done a study of that and has been able to show that the depth we get corresponds with the histological depth, although you do have to um, uh, account for the fact that uh, histological samples are dehydrated and so the depth will be smaller typically. Um, this is a common problem with new technologies. They may be even better than what's there already, hopefully, uh, but then you have to compare them and convince the clinicians based on the existing gold standard, which you may feel is, is a little unfair because you're, it shows your technology has been inaccurate when maybe the Maybe it's the existing technology that's inaccurate. Um, so we can scan over the surface of these things then and see, you can see that the melanoma, hopefully you did see was, or the melanin was at the bottom of that lesion uh, and you can work out the depth and you can do this also with these more complicated ones. You can scan right through uh, and see which part of that has a deep lesion and therefore um, you can, pick that area to biopsy. Uh, you can decide whether or not to remove all of that lesion on the basis of, of that image, perhaps. Okay, I'm gonna move on in the interest of time, but you can produce these 3D images, which may be helpful. So um, really to think about the future stuff, um, I've thrown a couple of things out here, uh, which uh, some of which I will touch on in maybe more detail. I'm hoping we'll see more diversity uh, in um, biophotonics. Uh, we're certainly working hard towards that in SPIE and OSA and, and through other fora. Um, and I encourage you all to, to support that effort. 
Um, that means that, you know, we want to see uh, more uh, gender diversity. We want to see more um, uh, color diversity, race diversity, uh, re religious diversity, and so on. Um, and I think that will be quite quite important, both in terms of um, seeing them in the high ranks of our professions, but also in the target population of the medicine. Is the technology we are developing in itself racist, either because uh, we are only thinking about uh, the people who look like us, or because um, in some cases it can be harder to get optical technologies to work through a layer of uh, melanin. Uh, so these are things to think about. Um, and uh, it becomes more more important. I expect that artificial intelligence uh, will become more established. It's really starting to take off, but I think that will be a much, much bigger trend um, in, in the future. And I think the resistance to technology will perhaps um, fall aside to some extent as specialities like ophthalmology, for example, becomes overburdened. So the specialists um, don't need to uh, restrict access to their profession or to, um, I suppose, cordon the patients for themselves. Um, because they just can't get through the lists that they have already. And if AI can help with that, I think that's that's good for everybody. And as we see with DeepMind and others, uh, Pierce Keane, for example, in UCL, showing that uh, AI can make diagnosis um, better than, more accurately than than the vast majority of uh, his colleagues in, in ophthalmology, then think people have to start to take notice of that. So uh, that leads then into equity and access to medicine and medical technology. Um, and I think especially because of the current pandemic, there will be a much bigger emphasis on infectious diseases and cancer. Um, we see the rise of nanotechnology and everything from face masks to cell tracking, uh, the face mask uh, the nanotechnology component of face masks apparently has reached 1 billion euros in uh, of, of sales in the last uh, six months. So it's being used as um, a germicide. Uh, it doesn't kill the virus itself, but it kills the things that live in your mask because you've forgotten to wash them or change them. Um, yeah, I, I personally would like to see opt-out organ donation. So in other words, you know, if you want free access to medicine, as we have in many countries, then perhaps the quid pro quo is that you give up your organs when you uh, when you no longer need them and more opt in in vaccination. Um, hopefully, one outcome of the current pandemic will be that science saves the day and people will start to move away from the anti vaccine movement and um, be, be more, uh, be more uh, uh, trusting in science, let's say. Yeah, so there will be mostly incremental um, improvements, of course, and those we can envision. We can also envision uh, multimodal uh, approaches, although, you know, we do have to be careful about how much we think that will go. Uh, uh, how, how much that will work um, in some parts of the world, maybe that will work okay. They're very developed uh, parts of the world. Um, many parts of the world, six billion and vast and, and rapidly growing people will not ever have access to um, MRI, for example. So the idea that you would add it to um, uh, CT or um, PET, and you be using that for diagnosis on a routine basis is, is not really realistic. Uh, in fact, it's probably not realistic to see MRI being used in routine uh, diagnosis for, for most of the diseases that we can think of simply because the access, the amount of time it takes and so on is just uh, too restrictive. Um, uh, we 
talked about this in Photonics 21 and we um, decided that the thing that we should be trying to develop is the Star Trek tricorder. Uh, so where Dr. Spock scans over the patient and uh, the instrument tells him what's wrong with the with the patient instantly. And that I suppose is the kind of thing we'd like to get to. Um, this is a mission impossible, I suppose, but uh, that's what we do all the time and what makes what we do exciting because we're always proposing something that's currently not possible. We're promising to do it. Um, and then we, we try our best uh, to deliver on that, which is perhaps the hardest part. Um, and it's, it's a very, very competitive um, enterprise. Uh, so we, we need to be cognizant uh, also of what happens in biology um, and medicine and what do they need? Because we're looking at this from the point of view of we have these technologies and where can we push them onto the biologists? But um, a, a better approach, and some groups are taking this approach, uh, is to say, well, what do the biologists need? Um, what, do, what do they need in medicine? And what can I do to deliver on that? Um, I, I've seen recently a paper, I think, from maybe the Vienna group or the Lübeck group, uh, which was able to see which, um, uh, which uh, cells were lighting up in the retina uh, when a pattern was was uh, seen by a person. So you can actually tell what the person was seeing, um, presumably even if that person uh, was not conscious, you would be able to tell the pattern that, that is uh, being presented uh, to their eye. And that leads to the question, well, can you see what's in their dreams or, or can you see uh, maybe in the future what they're thinking? And uh, that starts to... Um, starts to ask all kinds of questions. Can we employ optogenetics, another huge um, leap forward recently, in order to determine which parts of the brain are active uh, when we're thinking about certain things, and then um, in what way are they active, which neurons um, are active, and uh, can we somehow find out at least some simple things about uh, how people are thinking um, measuring directly pain or measuring directly euphoria or some other emotion, for example. Um, I, I mentioned that, uh, that uh, diversity is important and of course the Black Lives Matter movement will presumably help to push that forward in all our consciousness. Um, well, in the, in the um, current situation um, and even in the far distant past, we have had the development of, uh, for example, photosynthesis, which um, is a very early um, development which allowed life to, to exist. And we can see all kinds of other biophotonics going on in nature, including uh, photaxis and bioluminescence and, and so on. And um, if we look at the, the present, we have access to laser surgery, well-established uh, light-activated therapies, low-light, uh, low-level light therapy, um, and so on. Uh, we have also um, the extinguishing of uh, viruses and other germs, bacteria, uh, using light at 254 nanometers. Um, I could see in the future that being... Uh, improved by moving to 222 nanometers, which would uh, re hopefully remove the need for individuals to leave the operating room or the area that is being sanitized. Um, so you've seen maybe all of these things, wonderful things going on in diffuse tomography and so on with uh, uh, the Fantini group, Arjun Yeo, Jana Kainerstoffer, and, and so on in these areas. Um, and hopefully this will lead us to one of the most intractable problems, which is um, what is going on inside the brain and how can we fix it? The, the level of therapy that's available uh, for mental health issues currently is, is um, 
really uh, something that we can't be very proud of. Uh, it doesn't seem to have moved on a whole lot um, in hundreds of years. There are very minor improvements in a very small number of areas. So in the future, we'd like to see, uh, I suppose, a lot more automation and AI improving uh, how quickly we can diagnose things. Uh, AI is good at seeing patterns. It won't take over from humans in determining what those patterns really mean, uh, or what is the physical uh, significance of those, uh, or physiological significance of those uh, patterns, but it might be able to match them up to particular diseases or to particular mechanisms of action, uh, for example, um, with some guidance from humans. Um, Nanomedicine will become more and more important, I believe, but it needs help to get into the clinic, as does the stem cell therapies uh, that I talked about. So um, more automations. Uh, let's hope that the result of all of this is not that we put people out of work, but we allow uh, humans to do things that are more useful and more interesting and can be only done by humans and take away that repetitive, uh, boring stuff uh, from humans. Um, here is a quick timeline just to remind people that, you know, uh, Hippocrates was already thinking about biophotonics uh, 400 years before the common era. And uh, used cyanosis, uh, the bluing of the lips, as a diagnostic uh, for uh, cyanotic heart disease. Um, so low oxygen giving um, a change in color to the lips. Uh, we then had the many other things happening, of course, in between here, but we had the microscope uh, developed by Robert Hooke, and uh, he uh, showed with his compound microscope uh, plant cells uh, in his book published in 1665, uh, Micropagia. And uh, Van Leeuwenhoek uh, may have already been working on this, but or may have been inspired by that, but in the same year uh, produced um, exquisite images that were maybe um, uh, at least one order of magnitude better resolution by using just a ball lens. Uh, for his observations. Um, and of course, then there's fluorescence and then um, uh, photoacoustics is in here. You might wonder why. Well, Alexander Graham Bell was uh, proposing that as a way to transmit um, telephone conversations or phone uh, conversations in, in any case by the photoacoustic effect. Of course, that got taken over by uh, copper, but um, People have been using that in more recent times uh, to look inside the body. Um, the pulse oximeter is another interesting one. Taco Aji sadly died earlier this year in May, uh, but uh, he noticed uh, the little pulses on an optical signal he was measuring in a rabbit ear. And instead of just filtering them out, realized that he could use that to measure the oxygen saturation uh, because that variation was only what was going on in the artery. And uh, interestingly, uh, that didn't really take off until the 1980s, uh, at least 10 years later, when William New realized that this could be a great tool in anesthesiology and commercialized it for that purpose. Um, so we have many other improvements uh, happening over the years. Um, uh, OCT, uh, microangiography, um, optogenetics, um, our heart rate app, which is developed just when uh, the time was right. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, we have to be careful about uh, AI uh, because, you know, uh, we might find that we put in an input image that looks like this and we get um, a much uh, better image coming out. But you will notice that the image here that AI gets is not the image that um, the original image, but both of them manage to uh, downscale to the right, um, to the right image in the end. So 
um, this famously uh, is connected to a um, mistake that this kind of technology can make where this character here, who some of you might even recognize as Barack Obama, uh, being recalibrated to um, be determined to be a, a white person with this face. So um, the technology is far from perfect and you will notice that IBM, um, Facebook and many other large companies uh, abandoned their facial recognition technology because the biases that we have um, as humans uh, managed to find their way into these uh, technologies, none more so than in the Harrisburg incident earlier this year, I think it was, uh, where they said that facial recognition would recognize uh, who was a criminal and who was not. And of course, this was based on historical data over who was convicted for crimes and who was not um, a data of got from the New York Police Department. And um, many people would say that that data is not perfect and therefore that's why you don't get accurate results with it. In other words, there's a bias against uh, certain groups of people. Um, our ability to um, tell what's going on in the brain has been foreseen, I guess, by Steven Spielberg and others. Um, this slide comes from, uh, from Sergio Fantini, so thank you Sergio for that, um, where uh, Spielberg is thinking about um, whether humans could predict uh, which type of person would commit a crime, and they call this precognition, um, and uh, as I say, that's, that's based on very shoddy science, um, it makes great movies. Uh, I mentioned earlier their correlation mapping OCT uses the fact that wherever things are moving, uh, that's probably blood flow and where they're not, that's static tissue and we can draw maps of human blood. Again, this can be used to recognize individuals. This though is based on, you know, their real fingerprint, um, which is held by um, you know, the the uh, passport databases um, and, and so on, uh, but it should be the same as the subsurface fingerprint, which is down here at this level, um, a separate fingerprint, but about a third of a millimeter below. The pattern of the sweat ducts should follow the same pattern. The pattern of the blood vessels should follow the same pattern. The pattern of the blood vessels feeding the little uh, capillary loops coming to the surface should also follow the same pattern. So we can be perhaps more secure in the future using these kind of technologies um, that the person who's being moved from one country to another is not being human trafficked uh, as though they were a different person and so on. And of course, access to our own data, our phones, our financial um, uh, institutions, our banks, um, might be safer with that kind of technology rather than the surface fingerprint that is currently used. Um, okay, so I want to move on to talk uh, and give the example of the heart rate app, which I guess we would not have predicted as to have taken off so much um, 10 years ago, and it is 10 years from its invention. Um, we thought that other things might take off like um, using the microphone or something, some other attachment like that. But it turns out that using just the phone is, is quite an attractive option rather than a Fitbit or something else. Um, and uh, it's an odd thing for, for many reasons, but uh, the situation at the time was the World Health Organization talking about cardiovascular disease as being the most important and increased resting heart rate uh, being associated with increased blood pressure and that being on its own a good indicator of cardiovascular health led us to say, well, okay, we know a little bit about tissue optics and we know that phones now have a light source and a camera and some processing and we can actually access the software there. So um, let's see if we can measure the heart rate. And we went ahead and did that. 
Um, you have to remember at the time, uh, smartphones or phones looked a little different to what they do now. We had just about got to this point uh, with, the, with the Blackberry um, uh, phones. And uh, so they'd been improving in their smartness over the previous uh, couple of decades and really had got to that point where they'd been called a, a camera phone for some time because they included cameras and now suddenly they are smart. Um, phones had been used for health before that, but mostly just to transmit, collect and transmit data. Um, also worth uh, pointing out uh, as we're on the topic of phones that technology doesn't always continue in one direction to smaller, 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 higher, higher resolution, um, deeper, 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 uh, you know, things can turn around. So here, the size of the phone turns out that, you know, the, the optimum size of the phone uh, in 2002, before you had a touch screen, uh, was what you could hold in your hand, I guess. And then it became larger later because people wanted uh, to watch videos and do other things on it and to be able to use the touch to type features and so on. Important to remember that, uh, you know, the, the operating systems that we were working at that time uh, were things like Symbian and RIM, uh, which people might not remember so much now, uh, gone with uh, Nokia and BlackBerry, I suppose. Um, iPhones uh, do a great marketing job, but do remember that uh, if you are basing your technology on an iPhone, you are excluding uh, you're excluding 88% of the population because they've stayed at 11 or 12% for all that time. Um, and so uh, we have billions of smartphone users, more than have clean water. Uh, we have downloads of apps which are uh, almost two orders of magnitude greater than that. If you don't understand why there are so many app downloads when you don't do so many, I suggest you ask a 10 year old uh, about downloading games on to phones and Android devices. Um, the availability of apps grew rapidly from the launch of the App Store around about the same time as we uh, started our app work, our heart rate app work. Um, it's closed down a bit recently due to security um, issues, a clampdown on security and rogue apps. Um, and we want these apps to work on uh, all skin types. So that's a really important consideration to keep in mind. There are lots of different devices that can be used um, in mobile health and if we look at the number of publications, which is, I guess, the most reliable thing I could find to indicate when uh, health apps took off, we can see it is round about uh, 2010. It really started to take off. These health apps here, as I said, we're really using phones to, to uh, collect data mostly and not really measure anything but they became really useful for starting to measure things around about that time. So the real start, um, the, the, probably the most used um, health app or component of a health app and the most used um, photonics app is, is I guess the heart rate app. Fortunately, we started um, this work uh, with uh, Enoch Jonathan in our group and he was, uh, closely involved with this work. And in fact, the first measurements were made uh, on a very uh, a person with very darkly pigmented skin, as you can see, uh, on these very primitive uh, phones. And nonetheless, we were able to get uh, good data, uh, particularly from the green channel, uh, which um, Fitbit and others uh, started to use later on. The data you get today is much better but still, if you look for Fitbit on a black hand, uh, this is what you see. And it makes you wonder uh, about the biases that there you can go down through pages and pages and pages of this. And you, even though you've said you're looking for a black hand, you don't actually see one or at least very few of them. And it turns out um, I was looking at that for a good reason. And that is that um, 
famously, the Fitbit didn't work very well on the black hand. And eventually people worked out that if you turned the watch backwards on your wrist, uh, where there is much less melanin, uh, that it would work much better in that scenario. And uh, this is because they decided to use green light, uh, which we had used in, in our publication originally. Yeah, uh, so that's one of the, the free heart rate apps that's available. If you're interested in this, you can actually uh, look for our apps. If you look for Go Photon apps, you will see that and you will see the code for both the heart rate app and uh, the diffuse reflectance app. And they have inspired studies, including the ones at Stanford, um, where we're now able to, to look at um, data from hundreds of thousands of individuals and the one at UCSF. Um, and these use heart rate app as one of their most important inputs because it's easy to get and it is uh, indicative of cardiovascular health and could be at least one of the biomarkers as input to that could tell us who we really need to be bringing into our clinics very soon. Um, Biophotonics has made it into popular culture. Some of you will have recognized um, uh, Howie and Raj from uh, the Big Bang Theory in this image. And in the background, there is a SPI Biophotonics uh, poster, which is actually this poster. Um, if you want that poster uh, for real fans, uh, do let me know. I can get you access to that or send you a poster if, if you wish. Um, but it does also um, was produced by um, uh, the good people at UC Davis and they uh, talked about what are the important things, detecting early cancerous changes, better targeting of tumors and fewer side effects. We really have to move a lot more of our effort into therapeutics because that's where most of the uh, issues are. 75% of the need is in therapeutics, 75% of the solutions we provide as biophotonics experts are in diagnostics. So we really have to change that equation. Um, so you can see uh, treatment in a bandage. So using uh, light built in to a bandage to uh, activate a photodynamic therapy drug, for example, um, all very uh, interesting um, uses of biophotonics. Um, and um, I want to, to say a few words about how you can make an impact. And, and I want to base this on the idea of the, um, the heart rate app. So uh, maybe finishing up with that focus, focus on what you know. Okay, so I really say to people, you know, excellence in what you know will always um, put you in great position to take advantage of uh, things that come along. And I, I do remember many years ago being, uh, being told or, or heard the answer from a Japanese individual who was at the forefront of fiber optic developments that uh, being lucky is important, but you have to be able to take advantage of that, that luck. So, you know, be good at what you do, watch out for things that happen, especially in consumer technologies. Just so happened that in 2010, smartphones really became smart and good biophotonics instruments. Um, we weren't thinking of a 500 million problem, uh, person problem at the time because actually there was only uh, probably 10 million smartphones in the world. So we couldn't have thought that there would be 500 million people using um, this technology. Uh, but if you can think of a problem that is big like that, diabetes and um, uh, cancer, uh, infectious diseases, um, definitely those are things to go for. And um, if you're being held up along the way with uh, getting it patented via your university and all the rest of it, just give it away for free uh, and be the first to publish and at least you get uh, some of the fame out of it, if not the, the fortune, right? Nobody knew how to monetize apps back in those days anyway, so we probably wouldn't have been successful in getting any money out of it. Um, Think about where you can reach to. Uh, think about the terminology used in publications. Uh, our heart rate app publication talked about photoplethysmography, which is why nobody associates it with the heart rate app. Um, so 
scientifically correct, uh, but uh, a very bad marketing move, I have to say. Um, finally, I'd like to say social justice is, is really important. It's important that we remove the barriers, right, rather than um, what we mostly do at the moment, try to provide um, supports. Um, we were lucky um, that in our efforts in science uh, very early on uh, applying biophotonics uh, included people of color and we have a quite diverse group. So uh, we are conscious of this in all the things that we do. Hopefully people will have access to these technologies. Um, I hope equity in that gets better. I, um, that's a very optimistic view. Uh, many people would not necessarily support that. If you're interested in diversity, I would um, push this recent document that we produced at SPIE that you can get at this uh, link down here. And uh, remind people that we run a summer school every couple of years where we bring the best people in the world to talk about the important topics in biophotonics. Uh, and we invite them and they always come, which is great, except this year. So, so they did it online uh, and we reached, uh, instead of 50 people, 500 people. So that's, that's another change for all of us. Uh, thank you to Akil. Thank you to all the people in my group who have contributed. And thank you to anybody out there, if there is anybody listening. Um, the, the main advice I have for people is, is that, you know, don't um, worry too much about the area you're in and whether or not that's the cool area to be in. I would say to people, you know, if you're, if you're in it and you're dedicated, you know, that is your, your PhD, then focus on being excellent at that and the opportunities will present themselves. Um, but as I say, you can, you know, you can look at uh, the things that are happening in uh, the, the big technologies, especially the widely used technologies like phones and audio equipment traditionally and, and things like that, they always led to some suddenly something wonderful happening. So, you know, you have a microscope, suddenly we find out there are cells and there are uh, there are even animals that are one cell and, and uh, you know, you have a telescope, you find out you're not the center of the universe you know, within a year, right? Which is amazing because it took thousands of years to get to the point of having the telescope in the first place or, or the microscope in the first place. Within a year, profound changes are made to, to what we do. So, so technologies like that um, profoundly change the, uh, the way uh, we go forward. I would say um, maybe uh, mix in some AI. Uh, it's very accessible. Nowadays, um, uh, uh, you know, anybody with uh, a laptop can access AI algorithms and can apply that to their data. Um, be careful about that, you know. Uh, if you put rubbish into your algorithm, you will probably still get rubbish out uh, and think about what you're putting in and what you're putting out and whether the training set that you use is relevant to the data you're analyzing. It should not be the same data, but it should be uh, relevant. Otherwise, you'll get um, exactly the wrong result, right? Uh, and and somebody will go to prison or whatever, right? Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, I think um, the brain is, of course, um, always going to be of enormous interest. But there are many, many other things. I, I remember uh, many years ago when I was working in dermatology in Oxford, um, we were in some ways the poor relation, like they, you know, this was the low end of medicine kind of thing. Um, until my professor pointed out to me that, you know, that there are many people uh, in the world who can't go for an interview or can't have a social interaction or can't get involved in life generally because of some dermatological problem, uh, whether it be this um, extreme uh, uh, sweating or psoriasis or eczema of some kind or the sort of elephant syndrome and lymphedemia, all these things um, that 
you know, probably don't bother people as much as they think they would bother them, but they themselves um, worry about it. And, and of course they turn people's heads and, and you know, that, that can be upsetting for people. So yeah, um, you know, uh, th these are all important problems.